listening tends to be contagious. So how each of us listens does tend to wear off on other people. So I noticed, again, with my children, that when I listen, what we call, I often call listening to win, uh, which is to just make them wrong. Or like when I say, well, that's not true. You, you look great. Or don't worry about that. You, you know, you'll be fine. They, they don't feel heard. I find that when people feel really, really, truly seen and heard, it's one of the most extraordinary experiences um, that a person can have. And so um, just being around that and having the experience of being on the receiving end of that sort of deep listening where you feel truly seen and fully seen is itself a condition, right? For, for learning to listen well. Let's start with adult development theory. What is it and why does it matter? So adult development theory is a, I sort of think of it as a, a map. It gives us, it's a, th- there are several different adult development theories. I won't go into detail about them, but, um, but they are, each of them is a theory that describes how once we get to be adults, so once we look like adults, um, what happens to, how does our sense making change? And the big news of adult development theory, really, when it, when it first was introduced about 50, close to 60 years ago, was this idea that even when we look like adults, we are actually um, like what's not vis- so easily visible uh, can, but doesn't always continue to change. So um, just because someone looks, you know, that's 25 years old and looks like they ought to be a fully formed adult, there are still ways that the way they make sense of themselves in the world keeps changing. Um, so it gives us a kind of a map to describe how that happens. And that's useful in a variety of ways. Can you go deeper on that sense making? Yeah. So sense making is, um, is basically how, how do I even know what, what I'm seeing means, right? So earlier in our lives, when young people look out at the world, what they see, uh, makes sense to them in relationship to, uh, their own kind of physical well-being, mostly. Like they look out and see things. Like I would look out and I would see um, my mother, you know, having a stern face with me. And what I would think was, what does this mean for me? Am I in trouble? Have I done something? Do I need to change something so that I will be okay? Later, we look out at an angry face and we think, oh my goodness, I've done something wrong. I've hurt somebody. How do they? They might think badly of me. So I must be bad. So therefore, what do I need to do to make the mirror that is this angry face looking back at me uh, be different so that I can feel okay about myself? Later on, that changes, right? I see an angry face and I might wonder, wow, what's going on for that person? Um, What might be happening in their life? And it doesn't get so conflated with, with me. I'm kind of I get to be more separate from that angry face, but I wonder what does it mean and what, what might I, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't like influence me so much. So that's what I mean. Does that help? Yeah. It's like we're making meaning out of what we're seeing. Yeah, exactly. But then there's another aspect to it. So we look out at the world and what is, what meaning do we make of it? But also there's a way, um, it's like, how do we make sense of ourselves? And that changes over time too. Of course, that's like, closely related to what we see outside of us, but it's this, it's this, um, interplay. It's really what we see. It's the, it's the meaning that we construct. It's often referred to adult development theories are often referred to as constructive developmental theories because it's, it's a question of, it describes how do we construct reality? How do we construct meaning? And then how does that change over time? And are there ways that we can change it or is it just a way that we understand how we develop? I described it as a map that's really helpful because it gives us kind of a, it it helps. I find that with my clients, certainly with myself and with my clients, it helps people understand. It gives people a language, a way to see um, what might be happening, what what may have happened, um, like how I construct meaning of myself and the world has changed up till now and how it might change in the future. So it gives me like a reference point. 
Um, and yes, of course, we there are many. Uh, this is what developmental coaching is is all about. It's like how do we take the experiences that happen to us every day and use them when when we are not quite fit, we find ourselves not quite fit for our, for our context, like up to what, what Bob Keegan called it in over our heads. Um, how can we, what moves can we make to try to develop our, our meaning making to be more fit for the context? It happens better with company. It's a kind of a hard thing to do alone. Yeah. I want to talk about that a, in a bit in terms of how we make sense of ourselves and, and how other people, it, it prompted sort of something that you told me earlier, as you were saying that, that a few years ago, uh, a friend of yours noticed that you were saying things like, I need to check in with the kids, or I have to get home right after we finish up, which prompted a conversation on the need tos versus want tos. Can you explore a bit of that to me and the language that you're using? I find that uh, I have a couple of go-to interventions. Um, I'll call them interventions. They're basically, um, when I say intervention, I mean um, a kind of a, something that disrupts our normal patterns and language, um, noticing and disrupting language patterns, I find to be very, very helpful as a developmental move. So yeah, that, um, that story happened about, you know, 10 years ago when my children were younger and I was, um, I was really torn a lot of the time because I was traveling around the world. I was really feeling like um, I was experiencing the most exciting period up until then of my professional career and all parts of my life. And I had these three children at home and a husband who was there with them most of the time because he's a teacher, so he didn't travel. He was around more. And I felt torn you know, between these two parts of my life. And a, a good friend of mine noticed that I often, when talking about my kids and my family, just as you said, um, used the term, have to get home, uh, I need to check on them, I need to call. And um, so this, I already had had this idea that our, that our language is not just an expression of our meaning making, but it also shapes our meaning making. So when this friend of mine noticed my, that language pattern, I began to ask a question like, what could I, what words could I use um, that might actually change the way I make sense, make me, help support me to be less torn about this kind of kids and family and the rest of my life thing. And so that's what I mean. And I did. So I started to really deliberately notice, and I could also feel it in my body, you know, when I was about to talk about need to and have to, um, there's like this tightness and constriction. And um, when I changed the words to want to, it sounds like the tiniest intervention, right? It seems almost so simple as to be silly, but it really, really changed the way I made sense of my relationship to my responsibility, the, the role in the life of my family, you know, rather than something I had to do, um, I was able to discern better between what it was I wanted to do um, and therefore how places, uh, it, it made it possible for me to show up differently with them as well. Because effectively you're choosing it, but if you feel like you you have to, then you, it, it almost feels like not a choice. I almost think of this in, in terms of three categories, which is like things I have to do, like I fundamentally just have to do them, things I want to do, and then things other people want me to do. And this helps me when I, especially when I feel busy, it helps me prioritize what I choose to take on. And it, it's that little nuance in language that is really interesting. And then often another nuance in language that you, you sort of prompted as you were talking is when I make a decision, I usually, I try to say I choose to mm. because fundamentally I'm making a choice. The thing that you're pointing to there, Shane, is that, um, that just by using the language I choose to, it actually cultivates, uh, it creates or constructs a new meaning around what you're doing. Right. Rather than right. the world or someone else doing it to you, you are, it's like you're, you're, you're stepping into it in a, in a different way. And I have agency. Yeah. Yeah. And it isn't just a pretend thing. You know, they, this whole idea of acting as if it's talking as if speaking as if um, I were choosing after a while that translates into 
um, you're actually seeing it as a choice. So it's quite powerful language, I find. And often we just think of it, our language as throwaway, right? Um, we don't see it as so important. It's almost invisible to us a lot of the time. It's habitual. One of the words that you used uh, in that um, response was torn. And often a lot of us are feeling torn between competing parts of our life. And, and we sort of, the words that we use to describe this uh, range from balance, work-life balance, to harmony, to integrated, to a mosaic. How do you think about that? And how do you help people who uh, want to fulfill multiple parts of their life and they um, seem to have competing demands? A lot of it really depends on where they are in terms of how they make sense of, of these things. So work-life balance, like notice the difference between work-life balance and mosaic, right? Those are, those are really different. And um, so if I, if, if someone, you know, that I'm working with is talking about work-life balance, I may not um, immediately go to, what if you thought of it as a mosaic? <laughs> um, so because the work-life balance, um, it's almost, I get the visual of a, of a, one of those old fashioned scales, you know, and you're trying to get it just right. I need just enough of um, work and just enough of home just to get it just right. And it's as if there's a, a balance point that you can reach um, that will be um, static and sustainable. So if someone sees it that way, um, I would, I, I would probably ask um, a question like, um, you know, what's the most important thing to you about getting the balance just right? Or what's the worst thing, you know, about not getting it just right? So I would probably want to disrupt that the underlying assumptions about work-life balance is the thing first, um, or begin to offer it, offer a, a disruption and um, see where that goes. Um, I also have to find metaphors to be really helpful here. Um, with these sorts of things, because often um, I, I will listen to the, the metaphors that a client uses and try to tap into those. Um, so, um, so for example, um, when somebody is talking about balance, I will present to them like a scale, a, a, an old fashioned balancing scale. And I'll just ask them, like, how does that feel to you? Just, is that actually what you're going for here? Um, and often they will come up with a new metaphor. And, you know, then sometimes it makes sense for me to introduce a metaphor that's slightly different and ask them to consider that. So I think it, it's, it's working really with where people are and just little nudges. I personally find the work-life balance thing uh, really hard because you're never in balance. And the moment you are in balance, it's out of balance, right? Like you, you almost have to be actively uh, balancing at every moment and therefore you're always sort of failing to achieve a work-life balance because just the second you have it figured out you get an extra email or the kids need to be go to the doctors or something something just like tweaks it and then you're always just dis, you're you're dissatisfied unconsciously with yourself because you're you're trying so hard to achieve this perfect sort of balance that is um a pursuit and can never actually be realized. Jeez, I love that, Shane. You know, as I was thinking about, I was having this um, visual of, um, so instead of the old fashioned um, scale um, with two weights on it and trying to get that just right, which theoretically, you know, if you get it just right, it will stay as long as the wind doesn't come up or the earth doesn't move or something like that. Um, but uh, it, what if you were trying to balance a scale like that, like on a on a, a seesaw, remember from when we were kids, a, a seesaw, and you had to balance it with your legs. So you're standing in the middle and you had to balance it like that. That is constant work. So when I think of work life, like work and life and integrating these components of life, it's not just work and life, right? And we tend to break it down into this, but there's also your health, there's your community, there's all these other aspects that make for a meaningful life that once you start thinking about balance and you think about living a holistic life, it becomes impossible, I think, in, in my experience. And so the mosaic 
term or sort of like integration of things is very different because the pieces at different points can take on different shapes and sizes, but they're always there. They're always present and you're always giving some attention to it, but you know, it might be, I'm going to do less of this right now and more of this right now. And this Mm. needs to be a bigger piece right now because that's more important. Yes. I I love that. And on my better days, I, I see it that way. And, um, you know, when I feel overwhelmed, I don't know how it is for you. I'd love to hear, um, that it's harder to see it that way when things are really, really pressing on you, um, right? Because the the the, the mosaic um, requires actually that we be able to like for the for the mosaic to to for us to feel satisfied with the mosaic on any given day. In some ways, we have to be able to step back and look at it and see how beautiful it is. But when you're stuck in the mosaic because things are so pressing. Um, really can't see the beauty of it all you kind of yeah. can see is the mess yeah in any system you're part of you can never wholly see it right so you you have to have these tricks to sort of get out of it and get a different perspective on it and one of the things we'll probably talk about later is perspective taking as a means to do that but you can also take perspective with yourself yeah. uh, by visualizing sort of uh, five years in the future or you're 90 and what do you want life to look like and what's fulfilling to you and then working backwards from that. One of the things that was interesting to me about that story though is how your friend took the words you were using and ascribed a meaning to them and like sort of it was a deeper sense of listening to than just to the words. Can you talk to me about that? Yeah. So this friend is a developmental coach and she so she's kind of in the practice of wondering um what does when when she hears uh, a somebody use a word or a phrase um that doesn't like she notices the dissonance between what she would mean by that and what she notices i might be meaning by that right so this is the the listening below the surface this is listening for meaning um and so it's getting below underneath the story or the words and wondering, wow, what does that person actually mean by that? Um, and it's, it can be a really hard practice, practice to be in because we also have to, to do that well. We have to be able to notice what, do, what would I mean by that? What do I assume they mean by that? And, and wondering then, like, how is it different, right? Um, and always noticing what I think it means is probably wrong and how could it be wrong and therefore I have to inquire. And then the words that we're using change how we think. So the power of language is really important in that. How, how does the language that we use limit our progress or our ability? Our language tends to be habitual. And so we often don't, like I said earlier, we often don't even notice the phrases we use, right? So I had a, (laughs) I had a client, um, a few years ago who, um, who was trying to let go of the, um, you know, achievement oriented, um, nature of her life. She had a habit nature of be always trying to always needing to do things in order to feel valuable. And so she described to me um, what it feels like to her to be not um, not adding value, right? And so she talked about shuffling around um, aimlessly, you know, waiting for um, her prescription to be filled. <laughs> this was at a time when, when she wasn't, she that she was uh, recovering from an injury. So she actually had that experience, right? So she often used these terms that were sort of like, if I'm not doing something, I'm just kind of shuffling around waiting for things to happen. Um, so this is a, um, this was really helpful because this person is really quite good at using metaphors and she could describe it and sort of laugh um, at it. So we, you know, what we did was we explored what does it mean to be, like shuffling around waiting and who are you when you're shuffling around waiting? What does that mean for you? Um, but sometimes it's not that, um, it's not that overt. Um, and so language that is limiting for people is often as simple as what I, you know, described to you, the have tos and the, 
and the need tos, it often shows up as like, I am just this way. Um, Or I am the sort of person who has to respond when somebody emails me right away. I have to respond within five minutes. Um, So these are, I think, I I think of these as identity habits, uh, languages of habit, sorry, habits of language around identity. I am this way. I am that way um, kind of language. Other limiting language you can hear in what I sometimes call monolithic narratives. Um, So-and-so is always this way. At work, I never seem to get my voice heard. It, there are so many of them. If you start to listen to people's language patterns, um, you'll start to notice all the ways that they can be limiting and also enabling. So what we want is to find enabling patterns of language um, that that help us in service of you know what it is we care about. Talk to me a little bit more about language and our identity and how that affects our ability as leaders and people and perhaps our performance or how small shifts in how we see ourselves or even how we describe ourselves, even if we don't fundamentally believe it, can the language that we use talking about ourselves change who we are and what we're doing? So I'm going to start with a a definition of the definition I use of identity first. I think it might be helpful because that, that word gets used in a variety of ways and all of them are right, but I just want to be clear about what what I mean. I, I sometimes call it identity with a with a small I rather than a capital I. So it's, I don't mean um, like my social identity or my racial identity or my gender identity or anything, anything like that. What I mean is how I see myself. And I often talk about um, that our identity, how I see myself, um, and how I want to be in the world, how I want you to see me in the world, um, is is um, it, it's something we've been developing all of our lives, each of us, right? It's um, we adapt as kids. We learn what works. We learn what doesn't work. We amplify the things. We keep doing the things that work, and we tend hopefully stop doing the things that don't work. Um, so we get to a point in our life, any point in our lives, we have this sense of who I am, and we spend a lot of time. Um, projecting that identity, right? We've perfected it up until now. We, in, in what we do, what we wear, what we say, what we don't say, what we don't do, who we hang out with, um, we're always projecting this identity, right? Most of it's unconscious. Um, and so how, what does language have to do with that? Um, it's just one of many ways that our identity is expressed. And every time I say um, something like, um, I would never do that. I'm in the middle of a situation right now with a, with a, a neighbor who's constructing something next to my house. And um, I don't believe that this person has been particularly um, gracious or forthcoming or transparent about, about what they're doing. And um, I... I say, I said, found myself saying yesterday, I would never do that. I'm not the sort of person who would do that. And um, so that sort of, that, that, that reinforces my sense of myself as a person who's whatever, considerate, transparent, um, other focused. And so that serves me really well. Like it's part of, I think it's part of what makes me successful in life and in work. And um, it also can get in my way because I often don't stand up for myself. Um, and so if I see myself as the sort of person who would never do something that might, you know, upset another person, it really limits me, you know, that I can't do anything um, that would possibly hurt another person or seem like I'm putting myself first uh, because it would disrupt my sense of my own sense of myself. I think that's fascinating because one of the things I think about for biological creatures, which humans are, is that we have uh, an innate sense of hierarchy in the world. And hierarchy doesn't um, doesn't just mean status. It can mean identity-based hierarchy. And when you construct a world, and this can be completely wrong, so push back, but when you construct a world which is like, I'm not the type of person who would do that, you immediately put yourself higher than that person in this arbitrary hierarchy that you've created, which is like, no matter what, I would never do that to somebody. And you might be right and you might be wrong, but that that sort of like is not the point of this. It's just you're placing yourself 
sort of, in, and you're not doing it consciously. Like you're not trying to organize the world in this way where you're better than somebody else. And I remember I first did this when I was like 16 at a grocery store. We had this guy come in, he, he you know, he illegally parks, runs in, he's uh, rude to everybody. And, you know, I finally said something back to him. It was my last shift at the grocery store. So I won't say what I said, but, uh, you know, I, I was walking home and it was like, well, you know, I might not be rich and I might not be blah, 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 but at least I'm not. And then in that moment, I sort of realized that, you know, what I was doing, or maybe not in that moment, maybe later in life, but I realized that I was just creating this arbitrary hierarchy and trying to make sense of this situation and make sense of where I fit in this situation and how I handled myself. And in that moment, I was creating this arbitrary hierarchy in which that I was higher uh, than that person. That's a great story. What I really heard in your story that that really struck me was in this kind of identity-based um, hierarchy, most of the time we do it unconsciously, but let's be honest, there's a lot of that in the world right now too. Um, what we're doing is we're creating a separation between us and other people. Right. It's like, I'm not that. Go deeper on this creating the separation between us and other people is on the one hand um, for our own identity formation, it's, it's, it's useful. I think like how do we create, how do we construct our own sense of self again in an adult development way? How do we become um, self-authored, right? Like standing on our own separate from other people, um, this is important. This is important developmentally. The most complex problems that we need to to work um, in our in our lives these days, they require us to see other perspectives. They require that we build trust and connection with other people. And so each time we um, kind of fortify our own identity as separate, we are severing connections that might actually be really, really important. Like on a, you know, on a team in an organization, right? If you have separation among people, um, it is a detriment to trust. And when you're dealing with really hard problems that can't be predicted and something just happens, you have to be able to trust each other in order to respond well. Um, I mean, you can think of a million examples of this in all different facets of life. So I am really, um, one of the things that I care about a lot these days is connection and how important that is. And leaders don't think of that necessarily as a core part of leadership, or at least they haven't, um, you know, it, it, and it is, I think it's probably the most important thing. When you say connection, what do you mean? I mean, the relationship between, between people. So, I mean, um, people actually thinking about, um, impact on others, about cre about creating um, trust between people. I'm talking about um, like a world, I guess I, yeah, it, it's simply, it's, be, it's connection between people. It's love, it's trust, it's, um, it's seeing us as, as really, in, um, as, as um, interconnected with each other. You know, um, you affect me, I affect you, and together we are more than two people separately. Talk to me a little bit more about this. I, I, as you were saying that, I couldn't help but think of sort of uh, work from home as an example of having an impact on connection in terms of um, our impact on other people, trust, but our impact not only on the people we work with, but the people that we don't see. Uh, and what I mean by don't see is... Um, if you worked in a downtown core and you're no longer going to a downtown core, well, there's all those uh, little corner stores and Starbucks mm -hmm. and grocery stores that are now impacted by the fact that you're not going to work. And when you do um, go into work, you sort of get a more representative view of society. You might um, sort of walk by somebody less fortunate than you. You might interact with somebody else who has a very different view than yours. Everybody has that crazy person at the office, but that crazy person at the office sort of like actually exposes you to what other people are thinking in a different way. And now we're in our own bubble in a lot of ways, if you're working from home and you're 
you're, you're sort of less involved in society maybe. And so you don't see the impact that um, you're having on this broader community. And then also want to talk about trust and how, um, how trust is enabled or disabled by sort of um, being in person and physically connected. You're pointing to probably one of the most, the things that is most on the minds of the leaders that I am working with these days, um, this whole work from home hybrid work question. Um, hadn't actually thought about it in the way that you just described, not quite so vividly as you just described, Shane. Like when we, the bottom line in what I heard was that when we work from home, it's much easier to create our own echo chambers either on purpose or inadvertently. And um, because we have so much more control over what we let in and what we don't let in. Right. Whereas if we go. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. You're surrounded by a world that looks like you, right? So yeah. you, you hop on zoom, you have this interaction with somebody, you get off of it, you hang out with your friends, you get delivery of food, groceries, whatever. And the world just tends to look like you and the socioeconomic world looks like you, the political mm -hmm. world looks like you. Mm -hmm. and, and my hunch, and I hope I'm wrong, is that this starts to lead to political extremes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm, you're, you're hearing me hesitate here because it's such a it's such a dire um, hunt, the prediction, right? If, if we were to play this out without any um, kind of disruptions to that, then the world looks pretty siloed and polarized and, and isolated. And we may be like, I hear people talk about, and this was true for me, you know, when, when, the, when the shutdown happened, my three kids all came home from university and we got to spend a lot of time together that I thought we would never get again. So that was beautiful, right? People talk about the, the wonderful things about work from home. And those are um, your, your sort of um, dire story that you laid out um, doesn't take away from that. And I think we really, really need to watch for it. Um, and this is, this is one of the things that, um, that, we talk about a lot in organizations where I work um, it is that is you mentioned this earlier, taking multiple perspectives, right? Um, we have to often work to find the perspectives that are not only different from our own, but are maybe even threatening to our own. And it's hard enough work when we're showing up at the office every day and going out into a world where we see differences. Because let's face it, we can shut those things out even, even when we're out in the world. It's just so much easier when we're not interacting with, um, with people who are unlike us. Can you go deeper on, you said it was sort of top of mind to all the leaders that you're, you're talking mm -hmm. to today on this mm -hmm. work from home. Can you go deeper on the relationship between uh, remote work, hybrid work, work from home, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, mm -hmm. going to the office and its relationship specifically to connection. And mm -hmm. with connection, I'm meaning sort of impact and trust. Um, I mean, I don't know the answer to this, of course. Um, I don't think anybody does. Um, I mean, there is an assumption, you hear it in some industries, that, um, that going to, that getting people in the office is the only way to cultivate whatever the kind of office culture that, that people want. Right. Um, and, and that's a pretty simple solution. And it was the obvious one before the pandemic, because that's what most people did. Um, now you've got people who are working from home. And, and one of the things that we see, I had a, a conversation with a leader several months ago, um, who's in an industry where they really, really wanted to get people back to the office. And, um, He's the head of an office. And so he's really watching the dynamics and he really, really wanted people to come back. So at first he tried to get everybody to come back. And what he saw was real pushback from particularly um, the administrative staff. Now you could say that's a, like though you could make up a story that says those people just don't see the value of coming into the office. They just want their cushy little lives and to stay home. But when he looked deeper, what he discovered was that these people tend to live further from the office. So their commute time um, is really long, like over an hour each way. And the, the professionals, so what they would call the professional staff, tend to live much closer to the office. And so their commute time is in their 
when they're commuting, they're like in an Uber or something going from one side of Manhattan to the other side of Manhattan, and they're working while they're in the Uber too. So, um, so it, it's obviously a very complex um, question because um, what the pandemic has revealed is that for decades or longer, um, people have been coming into the office because that's the thing to do, but, it, uh, but there have been differences that have been not really acknowledged right? How coming to the office is a really different experience for different people. You could say the same thing about, you know, like women in a heavily male dominated um, work environment, right? Being at home, working at home for people who feel out of place in the office environment has probably also been a great thing for them in some ways. Um, And it's also true that for the most part, it's easier to connect casually when you're in the office. Um, and uh, so it is, it is not um, straightforward as everyone is finding out. Um, and so what is the U.S. particularly, what's the connection between that and, um, and tr- connection and trust? I mean, I don't know. You know, I, we've been a, um, our firm has been remote since we founded in 2011. And I'd say we have a lot of trust, a lot of trust, but we've developed mechanisms to be sure that we connect, that like create the conditions for us to connect frequently and deeply, um, both in the sorts of connections that we set up regularly as part of our systems and the way that we are together when we connect. Um, so that, so it, it really, trust really can happen remotely. What are those strategies that you use to create uh, trust and enable it? There are several, but I would say the, the, the biggest one is that when we meet, um, whether it's about a client situation or whether it's some internal kind of um, thing that we're discussing or whether it's just that we're getting together just to be together, um, we start every meeting with a check-in. And again, that sounds incredibly simple, but we, um, it's a, we see it as a system scanning exercise, right? So the check-in, um, someone poses a question and every person in the room responds to the question. And then we step back and get on the balcony and look at the patterns. The question being, what's in the room today? Like, what are the patterns we're seeing? And particularly when you do a check-in, um, it's important not only to see the commonalities, the themes, but also pay attention to the outliers and also what wasn't said. So it can take a long time to check in in this way. And if you think about it, when you bring a group of people together to do something, it's the people themselves that matter the most, right? That's the raw material um, from which the work is getting done. So, so this, is, this has become a, been a habit for us. We were doing it, you know, since the beginning. And um, one of our clients caught on to it early on. Um, and, and then it sort of became a thing that, that a lot of our clients do as well. One thing that you said there that was interesting was listening to what isn't said. Normally we do that through body language, uh, but zoom is a very, uh, you know, or video is very torso heavy and not as detailed for micro expressions as we're used to picking up perhaps in person. How do you listen to what's not said when our body communicates so much more than our words? I mean, the truth is we can't, right? You know, you, you, you can't see as much on video, as you said. Um, I would argue that most people don't pay that close attention to body language, even when they're in person. So that's, that's a separate topic, but learning to like making the helping, inviting the body in to be part of the conversation for everybody is, is a, um, a really, I think, a helpful move. But to your question, um, I think it really puts an onus on everybody to make the space to both to to ask questions like, what's not being said right now? How often do, have you been in a meeting? I'm, I'm curious for listeners too, like how often have you been in a meeting, especially a business meeting, where um, the facilitator or somebody stops to actually ask the question, what's not being said here? and then makes time for people to explore that. It just doesn't happen very often. That'd be an interesting question. 
it can be an uncomfortable question too, because, you know, when, when the, uh, you're running a meeting and you have something that you need to get done and um, to stop and ask the question, what's not being said here is essentially inviting a distraction from the, you know, the thing that needs to, to get done. It's a threat to often our sense of identity. You know, if, if I'm the one running the meeting and I have some identity around getting things done, that me inviting in different perspectives that might actually, quote unquote, derail us um, can be a real threat to my sense of myself as someone who gets things done. I want to come back to identity and language just for a second before we, we go to the next topic. Uh, is it something where we can create our identity through language? If we, for instance, want to go to the gym or be healthier and you say to yourself that I am, I go to the gym every day. I am the type of person who goes to the gym every day, even though you're not, you're creating this identity. And then you almost have a commitment and consistency bias to live up to this identity that you fabricated in your head just with these words. And so you're more likely to go to the gym because you see yourself as that type of person, even though maybe perhaps that wasn't, you're using language to create a habit. Absolutely. I heard something about that recently. It's that speaking as if, um, and yes, I totally believe that it's not a guarantee that you will, that if I, I talk about myself as a person who goes to the gym, that I will become a person who goes to the gym and it's a nudge to the system it's a disruption. It's a one of the many things that can create the conditions for me to become a person who goes to the gym. Talk to me more about creating the conditions. That was something you said earlier when we were talking to you. What does it mean to create the conditions? And what are the most useful ways that we can think about creating the conditions uh, for success or results or however you want to think or define that for you? Creating the conditions is an idea that is one of the core ideas moves in in complexity right so if you're wanting to make a change uh, in a complex system which since each of us as human beings is a complex system you know creating the change of becoming a person to go that goes to the gym that, that that's a that's a complex that's a change to a complex system right if I want my team to behave differently, um, I'm also dealing with complexity there because people are complex and human systems are complex. So the idea is that in a complex system, you can't make change happen because the first thing that you need to do is understand how the complex adaptive system currently self-organizes. So what are its current patterns? Um, so if you look at a, fa a family is one of the easiest ways to see this, right? Families have patterns. Um, they have dynamics, people play roles. And if you want to, um, um, we've probably all heard stories or been part of a story where one person in a family suddenly changes and um, it, it, it's the, the, the family tries to reject the change, right? They want to continue acting the same, even when one person changes. So the idea there is that in a complex system, you, you, you have to understand the patterns. And then if you want to make a change, um, you don't intervene directly um, because the system will push back. Instead, you make little nudges, shape the path, app, like amp, create and amplify conditions where um, so that something can change. So in that family example, um, you the family might, um, uh, a couple key members in the family, you might identify who, like, who are the strong attractors for particular un- welcome patterns um, and start with those people and maybe those people um, begin going to therapy or maybe it's really even much smaller, right? They get a buddy who has, um, who, who might have an influence on them in a particular way, for example, or conditions might be family dinners or they might be, um, so family dinners are a condition, um, I think that, that might create um, family, um, at least the conditions for family conversations. What role does environment play? Are there examples of sort of environmental nudges that you can think of that come to mind? We always have the, the opportunity to change our environment, right? As a way to help us, let's take the gym example, um, go to the gym more, or let's say we want to get fit um, or lose weight, right? Let, let's take losing weight. One condition um, that we could create is to take all the 
stuff out of our refrigerator that we're super tempted by that is not that doesn't contribute to our losing weight. <clears throat> Another way to create conditions if you want to get more if you want to get stronger is you could buy some like light hand weights and keep them next to your computer so that it's you don't have to do much in order to lift weights and get your muscles stronger. Um, buying a gym membership is an example of uh, kind of a direct intervention that often fails. I mean, it could be a condition creating thing, but but if we think that buying a gym member is going to make us go to the gym, anyone who's ever bought a gym membership or most people will at least have had one experience of doing that and finding that they just wasted their money. That's why they sell 12 month memberships in November and December, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They're creating their own conditions for uh, profitability because they know the patterns of human beings, the people who own the gyms. Yeah. Well, what about something that comes to mind for me, and this could be completely off, but sort of like hanging around people whose default behavior is your desired behavior. So if I'm a leader and I want to cultivate um, better listening and I hang around somebody like you, do I naturally sort of acquire um, better listening or if I am a runner and I join a running group, then I start to hang around with people who run and then it makes it more likely that I become a runner or that I enjoy running. And then that makes me run even more. And I often think about how environment, we think of our environment most of the time when it comes to mind as physical, but our environment is also our identity, right? We're creating an environment in our head, an artificial environment, if you will. Our environment is also who we hang around. Uh, yeah. And there's their sort of habits. And if we hang around people who are, are sort of um, politically extreme, we will eventually become politically extreme. Or we hang around people who are lazy, we become lazy. Talk to me a little bit about your reaction to that and what your experience has been. I'm chuckling because um, <clears throat> I'm the parent of three young adults. And anyone who has ever had kids, you might notice that who your kids hang around with feels really important. So I noticed that whenever one of, not as much now, but when they were younger, um, when my one of my children would be uh, have a friend that I thought would be a really good influence on them, either because they were like a hard worker or ambitious or kind or not the sort of person who got into trouble, I always thought that was great, you know, and I wanted to amplify that. Um, so I think the less lesson there is there are, yes, of course, the people that we hang out with, um, I think can make a huge difference in, in shaping and creating the conditions for us to grow in particular, grow and change in particular ways. And as I, you know, found out with my children, it's not a guarantee, right? So um, trying to orchestrate things just right so that, you know, you're hanging out with exactly the right people who will get you the exact right result is probably the wrong mindset. Um, the a, a more helpful mindset is that people, communities, do create the conditions for particular things, and we can be intentional about which people and communities we spend time with um, in service of moving ourselves in a particular direction and it's no guarantee, which is the way it is in complexity always. There's no guarantees ever. Listening is something a few people have told me that you're extraordinarily good at. I suspect that's because you, you listen below the surface uh, and to the meaning and not just the words. How would you teach uh, your kids to become better listeners? How do you teach adults to become better listeners? I, I guess the first thing I would say is um, that listening tends to be contagious. So how each of us listens does tend to um, wear off on other people. So I noticed, again, with my children, that when I listen, what we call, I often call listening to win, uh, which is to just make them wrong. Or like when I say, well, that's not true. You, you look great. Or don't worry about that. You, you know, you'll be fine. Um, then, um, then it might feel good to me in the moment, but is not kind of, they, they don't feel heard. I find that when people feel really, really, truly seen and heard, 
it's one of the most extraordinary experiences um, that a person can have. And so um, just being around that and having the experience of being on the receiving end of that sort of deep listening where you feel truly seen and fully seen is itself a condition, right? For, for learning to listen well. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, there are very particular techniques that help people listen well. For me, the most important one has been really the training and under, in and understanding of adult development theory, particularly the one that um, my colleagues and I are most um, have most depth in, which is the, the subject-object theory um, that it was developed by Bob Keegan and others. And in the subject-object theory, you're, what you're listening for, the stage of development is defined by what is subject and what is object. And when I, when I say subject, what I mean is like what you're fused with. It's like the water you're swimming in, the lens through which you see things, but you don't actually even know you have a lens. Um, and what is object is what can be held out and examined and talked about, um, like a, a value is object if you can see how it's shaping um, what you do and don't do. Um, a value is subject if it's invisibly shaping what you do and don't do, for example. So in the subject, um, this growth edge coach training that um, several of my colleagues and I run, what we're teaching coaches to do is to listen for what is subject and what is object. And um, in listening in that way, you have to be listening below the surface of the story. Um, and every time you hear a word or a phrase wondering, hmm, I wonder what that person means by that. And so it's amping up curiosity. Um, it's it's um, really, really foregrounding the fact that we, each of us never really knows what another person means. And um, so we can only be curious to find out. So those are one is osmosis, and one is really learning some very particular techniques grounded in a theory um, that help um, that help us develop ways to listen. I like the word curiosity because it sort of when I think of listening, I think of seeing the world through the other person's eyes. I don't have to agree with it. I want to see what they see, and I want to understand what they understand. One thing you said there that. Uh, I want to come back to you in part because I have a child that does this, is listening to win. How as a parent do I coach, uh, intervene, um, get this out of their system? How old is your child? 13. I ask that because um, it, it really does make a difference at their developmental stage, um, how how you might go about this. And I'm struck by by your <clears throat> phrase, I think you said, um, "How do we how do we, we coach this out of them?" Yeah, maybe that's the wrong phrase, but it like, drives <laughs> me crazy. <laughs> yeah, what, and he's what super drives- smart, which is like it amplifies it even more because often he's right. <laughs> ah, so what is the hardest thing for you about that? Uh, just the social nature of it, right? And how alienating it can be to um, always be the person who um, is listening to win, right? So from his perspective, it's, uh, I listened to what you said. There, it, I'm literal, right? Uh, and so it's it's incorrect. And I'm going to do you, he doesn't do it maliciously. He's like, I'm going to do you a favor and point out why you're incorrect. And as a parent, uh, I don't know what to do with this because on one hand, on a literal sense, he's right. On a social sense, he's wrong. Uh, And on a, is this going to get you what you want in life perspective? It's learning when to use that and when to not use that. And I'm struggling with him in terms of how I, I go about this. So you're worried that he will alienate people or is he alienating you? Oh, he's not alienating me. I I think I, I'm worried that um, he, it makes it harder for him to fit in or um, be accepted by his peer group. Ah, uh, yeah. So I can hear that really, that, that sort of deep, 
desire for him to not have, um, yeah, for life not to be harder for him because, because he is. He's playing on hard mode. Yeah. Yeah, He's playing on hard mode and he's already uh, exceptionally bright, which in another, another way puts it on hard mode again, right? Uh, In certain ways. So. Yeah, I hear so deeply this, I mean, geez, um, the, the wanting for, um, to wanting to help somebody change something that is making, in your view, making their life unnecessarily hard and, and then worrying that maybe tell me if this is right, but worrying that, um, that if you don't help them change this, it might just become a more and more and more ingrained habit that continues to make their life hard. Yeah. Well, I think that as, as he gets older, I mean, my role changes too, right? And it changes to, um, you're getting feedback. Are you seeing the feedback that you're getting? Are you, instead of a direct, uh, intervention, like don't do this, do <clears throat> this, uh, you know, it changes to when you did this, did it help you get what you wanted in that moment? Yeah. Right. Or yeah. is doing this going to get you what you want? And that coaching after the fact is usually very helpful for him because he's like, oh, Mm. I didn't mean it that way or I shouldn't have done that or I wasn't thinking when I said something. And so it it prompts at least a little bit of reflection around it, which we all have as adults too, right? Like we all say stupid things on occasion or make a comment that we didn't intend to make and it has an impact on another person. And then we reflect on it and we, we sort of, that reflection codifies the learning a little bit. So it takes that experience and it translates that experience into a little bit of learning. And with enough reflection and enough experience and enough iteration, enough feedback, we sort of self-correct as, as adults most of the time. Yeah. And I think you may have a part of your answer already. Um, so it sounds like what you're doing is your creating the conditions for him to reflect on what the impact of the way he's listening or not listening um, is, is having. Well, trying to, when, when you said the phrase listening to win and you were talking with your kids about not listening to win, I was like, well, is there a way that I can put a term around it or a label around it yeah. when I can just say you're listening to win yeah. And in that moment, that means this whole deeper conversation to him, which is like an instant prompt to correct or not correct, to nudge behavior uh, towards yeah. a better, that he's choosing, right? Because I don't want to make his behavior choices for him. But can I say something like that? And when you were saying it, that's what I thought you were doing. So this is where the question, I didn't I didn't intend for this to be like a, a longer question. but Yeah, yeah. Um, so your question is, is language... Um, giving language to something, can that be a help? Um, well, in, well, it's in sort of a, a broader question. If we take it out of, of the context of, of me and my son, it, it's sort of, can we learn to listen to ourselves better or does it take an outside person to sort of intervene and point out our blind spots? And with my mm-hmm. son, I'm trying to intervene or, or sort of point out a blind spot. You're blind to this. It's happening. I'm pointing out that it's happening. It sounded like that's what you were doing with your kids, or maybe I'm mm-hmm. misinterpreting when you mm-hmm. said listening to win, which I love mm-hmm. that phrase, by the way. Yeah. I, I, there, I guess my point is there are many things and what, that you can, can do to help somebody to notice what they're doing, in, term, in this case, in terms of how they're listening. One is... Uh, reflecting back to them what you're seeing um, and the impact of that. One is the invitation to invite them to reflect on it, the connection between what they're doing and what they want. Uh, Another is giving it language. I I love hearing that listening to win is such a powerful phrase. It it is because you you can just say that. It's like having a um, some sort of a reminder every time you do something, like a light goes off, something flashes, and it helps to cr- create the connection between this thing that you're do- a really instant connection, um, a reminder of what you're doing. So the idea of listening to win absolutely can be a, it's super helpful um, in, in shifting a pattern because it, it, it helps you to notice the pattern instantly each time it's coming up. We often cannot see what we're doing, and this is why we need company. And we need company with whom we have trust who will tell us things that we can't see in ourselves. 
um, this is this is one of the core conditions for being able to shift and change. How did you use listening to win with your kids? I mean, honestly, I didn't use the phrase with them. I wish I had now, you know, Um, I really wish I had been more explicit about it. I took a more kind of um, indirect approach in which, you know, for example, if my, I have twins and um, when, when they were younger, my daughter would often, well, they, they all listened to win all the time to each other. Um, but the, there were times when I can remember when my daughter would get so upset with my son um, for making her life miserable in whatever way, right? Like, I have to do all your social life for you. I have to remind you of, you know, what homework we have. Like, it was this kind of stuff. And um, what when she was doing that to him or vice versa, what I would do is I would come in and make what I would call a listening to learn or a listening to see move where I would say to her, it looks like you're really upset because, um, because he is relying on you for everything and you don't think he should have to be doing that and it's not your responsibility. Is that right? And you could just literally see her whole body like breathe out. So I generally took the approach of doing something different, of, of making a, a, a deeper listening move. Um, and my hope was that they would see that over time, um, and notice the impact it had on them. I probably could have been a lot more direct about it (laughs) now that you say it, Shane. I love these phrases, listening to win, listening to learn. I'm going to take this back and incorporate it and I'll, I'll report back to you on how, how it works. There is another one that you might find helpful, which is, um, called, we call it listening to fix. Um, and this is probably the, by far the most common one. So listening to win is let me make the problem go away by telling you you don't have a problem. Listening to learn or listening to see is, you know, getting underneath, really getting underneath the what's being said and reflecting back to the person. Um, and listening to fix is let me take your problem and solve it for you. I mean, this sort of comes back to... to um men are from Mars, women are from Venus in a way, right? Which is women typically listen to learn, men typically listen to fix, problem solve, and this creates a a divide between us. Or in your word earlier, instead of a divide, it creates space between us. But we we tend to think that listening just applies to words, but we can also listen to our bodies. I mean, our emotions, our feelings, these all come from the same systems that produce our words. And our bodies tend to respond to our environment more than our words or quicker than our words. How can we learn to listen to our emotions, our feelings, our body, and what it's telling us? I think that, well, there are many ways, but um, this one, I'll I'll start with how someone else can help us do that. Um, And this is what a lot of um, coaches do this, coaches who pay attention to the our people's somatic experience, is simply to ask. So if you were to say, Shane, I feel um, really um, like I have to get this thing done right now. Like I'm so busy, I can't be distracted by anything else. Um, I might say, so where do you feel that in your body? And if you're unused to even noticing that you have a connect, that there's any, that there's a connection, you might say, I, what do you even mean by that? I don't know. <laughs> and then um, I might just like invite you to, um, to turn your attention inward and to see if you can scan and notice if there's any connection and what it might be between any kind of sensation in your body and this sense of being super busy and don't have time for any distractions. So this is where another person can be so, so helpful. It's about creating, noticing connections between things that are happening in our head, which is what most people are used to noticing, um, and what's happening in our bodies. I like that question, where do you feel it in your body? And that's something we can even ask ourselves. Yes, so you don't need another person. It can become a habit, a habitual question um, that we ask ourselves. And, um, and over time people, uh, I'm a case in point, you know, I would 15 years ago, if you had asked me to notice where do I feel something in my body, uh, I would say, oh, I don't know. 
like I, I would say, okay, I can make something up, <laughs> you know, let me just make something up. I'll just tell you. I tend to notice this if I feel it in my jaw, that means that there's like a little bit of stress element involved in it for me or something I'm not looking forward to doing or we're only as good as the information we have. There's a saying in psychology that if you could see the world the way that I see it, you'd understand why I behave the way that I do. So a large part of the way we see the world is through the information that we have. A lot of times the information comes from the questions we ask. How do we go about the process of asking different or better questions of ourselves and others in order to get better or different information? The first thing is to notice the questions that you currently ask. So each of us has habitual questions that we ask as well of ourselves, of others, of the world. And for example, um, I, I was working with a coach years ago um, who was extremely helpful. And he noticed that I habitually asked the question, why do I do this? Why do I do this? And um, there's this idea that our questions direct our attention. So you were alluding to this a minute ago. So the question that I ask then becomes where I look. So my attention, because of this question, um, I would get sort of intensely focused on trying to figure out um, what was wrong with me or what was, you know, what 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 led me to do certain things, and that turns out to be helpful in some ways, but often, you know, like most of us, we hit a dead end with that question. Um, and so even if I got to the why I do this, it didn't always result in me changing behavior. So that's just a one example. So how do we get different questions? Um, I really do think we get them most from other people, often in, um, at least as a start. So we borrow them from other people. Right. Um, often when we're teaching about this idea of asking different questions, we ask the question like of, of an audience, um, uh, who in your life asks the, the, the questions that are either most different from yours or the best questions? And do, do you know what most people say? What? Children. <laughs> Children ask great questions because they're not, they don't have the overlay of what should I be asking? They don't have the overlay of I need to look smart. They don't have any filter. They're just asking the question that come, that occurs to them. And, and so these are questions that we often as adults don't ask anymore. Um, and so like, like, why is the sky blue? <laughs> you know, I, for, for example, we don't ask those questions anymore because, you know, we feel that's a question we either should know the answer to or it's not relevant. Um, and so um, we off, I often talk about borrowing questions from other people. So listen to the questions like I'm listening to the questions that you're asking, Shane, and I'm noticing some of them I love. They're questions I never thought to ask. And so like I'm making a note of them. I, I love those questions. So that's the best way I know how. Notice the ones you, you, you habitually ask and borrow shamelessly from other people's questions. I love the idea of borrowing. I mean, the, the whole theme of our podcast is mastering the best of what other people have figured out. So it's taking what you figured out and then integrating it into our lives so that we can become um, better at what we're trying to accomplish or, or live a more meaningful life in the process. I just want to say, Shane, that, that there's something that happens to us as adults um, that we think we have to have it all figured out ourselves, right? I don't, if, if you don't have this idea, this is great. For those of you out there who don't, who have never had that idea, um, you're way ahead of the game in my book. Um, but we don't, like the world is way too complex for that that sometimes our greatest resource is right there in front of us in the form of another person or someone else's idea. Um, it just is like, we don't have to do this alone. Yeah. I mean, it, it, if you think of it sort of as climbing a mountain, uh, you can start at the bottom of the mountain 
or I can borrow from somebody else and start at base camp, <laughs> or I can borrow from somebody else and start at like camp three. Uh, and if you get to the top of the mountain, and I'm just using the, the, the metaphor here, it doesn't nobody really asks, uh, did you did you start at base camp, right? Uh, and so if, if you can imitate other people uh, to the point where you can start at a higher level, a uh, higher position, uh, then that's awesome. And then you can iterate after you imitate. So it, it, you can take something. And I think it was Montaigne who said, you know, I have to digest it and I have to make it my own. So you can take something from somebody else and then you can reflect on it and digest it and put a little twist on it uh, that is maybe more personal to you. But I love the idea of um, mastering the best of what other people have figured out already. Yeah. And if you started at, thinking about your question, like, did you start at base camp or did you start at the bottom? And if you started at the bottom, why did you do that? You know, was it because, was it because you needed to prove to yourself and that would be perfectly legitimate, right? If you needed to prove to yourself that you could do the whole thing from bottom to top. Great. But if you wanted to get to the top and see the view from the top, um, yeah, maybe you didn't need to start at the bottom or even base camp or, or the next place. So when you work with people, you like to teach skills that are immediately useful mm -hmm. and developmental in nature. What are the common skills that you find people struggling with that you teach them that make a big difference? Well, I think the first one is probably listening. So listening better is immediately useful because it, um, it, it, it enables you to get perspectives that you might actually need to solve a problem, right? Super useful. When teams listen to each other really well, it makes room for all the perspectives that might be needed to solve the problem. Um, but listening is also developmental because it, um, it helps, um, it, it changes my relationship to me. Right? If I listen deeply, um, I begin to see that I, do, I might begin to question my own assumptions. Um, I might begin to see myself differently through your eyes. Um, so it's developmental in terms of the way I see myself. It's developmental, it can be developmental in terms of the way I see the world. The, the more perspectives I can make room for, the more complexity, the more the world becomes a mosaic, right? Um, and so I begin to see it um, in its fullness more and more because, and that is a developmental move. So listening would be the first one, I would say. Um, another one that I find really, really helpful um, is, um, well, actually the idea of complexity itself, right? So helping people to see the world, as a friend of mine used to say, to see the world as it is rather than as you want it to be. So there's a, you know, we, we teach about complexity through a particular framework called the Kinevin framework that I think is pretty widely known these days. Um, and so it's a framework that can help immediately um, to sort out if I'm facing some sort of a challenge, like again, as a team, um, to sort out which bits of the challenge are, are, are obvious so I can just like automate them um, don't have to worry about them, don't waste time on them, which parts are complicated, we need to figure them out, and which parts are complex, and then so we deal with those things differently, um, as we talked about earlier. But also seeing the world as it, this framework helps us see the world as it is in its full complexity, that is also um, really developmental because it changes the whole mindset, changes my sense of what I need to be to, as a leader, as a person dealing with it. Um, it changes my view of others um, from uh, obstacles to necessary uh, parts of the system. So there's all kinds of ways. Two of the ones that you've said in past interviews uh, that were the pyramid method and then polarity management, I believe. Yeah. Po uh, polarity management was the one that I was going to talk about next. Yeah. 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 So in a nutshell, for those of you uh, listeners who are not familiar, familiar with what a polarity is, this is based on the work of Barry Johnson, um, who developed the idea of a polarity 
um, years and years ago, decades ago. And um, I don't know whether it's just me who now sees it, sees polarities and polarity work everywhere or whether it's becoming more commonplace. I think it's a little bit of both. But a polarity is, um, it, it's, it's two things that um, are interconnected and that over time you need them both. So it's like a, an example in organizations is um, centralized, decentralized, right? Uh, If the question is, do we need to be decentralized or centralized? Um, Mm. The answer is most likely both, right? Yes. Sometimes we need to be decentralized. Sometimes we need to be centralized. Um, In some places we need, it's, it's in its dynamic over time, right? In a very personal sense, what I would call an intrapersonal polarity is, um, like is a question of do I focus on my needs or do I focus on others' needs? Right. Well, both because if I focus on only my needs, um, pretty soon I'm going to be able to get a lot of the negative aspects of that. I'm going to be isolated. I'm going to um, uh, feel disconnected, and I'm not going to be able to get my work done. If I focus only on other people's needs, I'm going to get the negative aspects of that um, because I will lose myself. I won't have a voice. Um, I'll probably get burnt out. So a polarity, or it's two things that are like an energy system in that they are inherently interconnected. And to get the best outcomes over time, you need both. Um, this is in contrast to um, a, a choice. Like there, I have a choice every day when I drive to the office. Do I go on the highway or do I go on the back roads? Well, like that's a choice. That's not a polarity, right? On any given day, I can choose. I'm fine. They're not so, super interconnected. Um, but polarities are so useful in organizations to help um, um, not, not only to get uh, different and more helpful perspectives on sticky problems, um, they also get people talking to each other um, in ways that, that, um, that I find quite magical. Um, but they're also polarities are um, seeing the world through polarities is also developmental because it literally changes the way um, you see the world. Because you look out at the world and suddenly you begin to see so many things are interconnected. So many things are not either this or that. Um, and and um, that's true inside me as well. You know, when we're younger, we tend to see ourselves as I am a this and I'm not a that, right? I'm an athlete and I'm not a student. Um, I am a, uh, a, a person who likes big crowds and I'm not a person who likes to be alone. Um, but as we get older... I think we most people, many people naturally start to see themselves in more nuanced ways. Polarity management, seeing polarities, polarity thinking helps us to see things in more nuanced ways, um, which, you know, not everything is nuanced. A lot of things are not. But when things really are nuanced, um, it's, it's helpful to see them that way and not try to shove them into a box of, of either or good and bad. A lot of what we've talked about today is sort of, uh, recognizing that we're in a system and then trying to get a better aperture into the system that we're in and to your friend's point about seeing the world as it is rather than have you as you'd have it be how do we do that how do we do that um i'm gonna just start for a second with why it's hard um it's hard because sometimes very often the world as it is can feel overwhelming. It can feel too messy to solve. Um, It can feel unpredictable. And in many ways, as human beings, we don't like unpredictability. Um, Although, interestingly, um, we do like unpredictability when it comes to things like athletic events. You know, like who would watch a, a, a soccer match um, if you knew who was going to win and exactly what plays were going to happen first, second, third, and fourth, right? We wouldn't do that. That's what makes it fun. Who would go to a, a movie if you knew exactly how it was going to turn out? But somehow in our own lives, we don't like unpredictability um, because it leaves us feeling sort of out of control. So seeing the world as it is um, does require a leap of faith in a way, right? That we will be okay. That, um, that we don't need to be able to control everything in order to, for ourselves to be okay. And so I think, um, you know, 
having that realization, really admitting that it is hard. We want the world to be a certain way because it's mixed. It gives us comfort. And then the second thing I think is, um, is practicing being in discomfort. So um, nudging ourselves just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit um, in safe circumstances to feel discomfort and stay in it. Um, our urge is like going back to the body. Um, uh, often w- there's this thing called what I call an action urge that when we feel uncomfortable, there's something in our bodies that is saying, get out of the discomfort. So we act or react to remove the discomfort somehow. Um, part of, of seeing the world as it is, um, not just kind of conceptually, but actually being in the world as it is, requires us to practice being uncomfortable. And um, our bodies are so, and, and all parts of us are really adaptable. If we, if we um, put ourselves in uncomfortable situations where there's a safe and supportive environment, um, it's like going to the gym. Um, if you want to build your muscles, you just have to go every day and you do it. Um, so those are the two things I would say um, are, are helpful, at least as starters. I think they're actually more than helpful. They're, they're required. <clears throat> That's beautiful. Most of us are aware that we have blind spots. Yeah. And taking somebody else's perspective helps us remove our blind spots. But when it comes to the moment, How do we prompt ourselves? How do we turn this knowledge into action? Mm -hmm. So we know we should do something. We know it's probably going to help us in in certain types of situations, but we have a problem taking this knowledge and transferring it into action. How do we, are are there prompts or habits like that we can develop or cues that we can use to uh, remind ourselves to take other people's perspectives? I do have a very specific answer to that, <laughs> to that question, um, which is, is a developing the habit of asking the question, how could I be wrong? So just think about that for a minute, right? Like it, it is most of the time we don't even think we're wrong. So the question, it doesn't even occur to us, could I be wrong? And the question, how could I be wrong assumes that when it comes to the perspective of another person, um, we probably are very wrong, right? Uh, Our perspective is our perspective and it's gonna be different from other people's. And so um, how could I be wrong increases our curiosity. um, And it it, ideally, the, the purpose of the question is to prompt us to get more curious to go beyond our initial kind of assumptions about, you know, what the truth is um, and get curious and ask questions of other people. And um, so this is, this is my favorite habit when it comes to perspective taking. I like that. It seems like something you could do individually and also as a group, instead of asking, how could I be wrong, but how could we be wrong, which is uh, in a way um, a pre-mortem. Yeah. I want to ask you uh, two other questions before before we wrap up here. One of which uh, is, what did you used to spend time on that you now see as unhelpful or not valuable? Oh my goodness, that's such a good question. Um, The first thing that comes to mind (laughs) is trying to be on top of everything. So I used to spend an inordinate amount of time trying to attend to everything from answering every email you know, within a certain amount of time to having, um, so having a clean inbox, you know, where I could actually see the bottom of the inbox on the first page, um, uh, attending to uh, making sure my house was clean. (laughs) This is one that I, I just had to give up when I had three young kids. Um, and so just, you know, knowing the latest, um, like research on everything, you know, and making sure that I knew every last um, possible question that someone could ask me before I walk into a situation so that I have an answer for everything. Um, these just don't seem, they first became impossible. So it was through realizing that I was in too much pain 
trying to get it, trying to get these things be on top of everything. Um, and now I see that trying to be on top of everything actually takes away my attention from the present moment, from being fully present. Um, so I, I see the temptation of it. And um, I just, I'm really, really grateful to be in this place in my life where I don't feel I need to do that anymore. That's a really good one. It, it's almost like um, you're not, and I, I, I'm not mapping this to you, but when we think of being on top of everything, it's not like we're consciously choosing to be on top of everything. It's almost like we feel like if we're not on top of it, everything what will other people what does that say about us what do other people think about us it's almost like somebody else has a scoreboard and part of that scoreboard is like are you on top of everything and then we're playing to that scoreboard and eventually as an adult you sort of like get to a point where you're like you know what i don't want to play by that scoreboard anymore because it's not serving me uh and it's just causing me to go crazy because it's almost impossible in 2022 to be on top of everything yeah. It, it, as, as you say that, I'm wondering, I'm asking myself, why was I doing that? And it would be a, so many different reasons, but um, I think it shifted over time. Um, but there's some element of if I'm on top of everything, my life will feel calm and settled. Like there's some sort of a destination in mind. It's like when you finish that last um when I was in university, you know, I'd finished my last exam of the semester. There was this momentary feeling of, oh, I'm done. So I think I was in search of that, oh, I'm done feeling. Um, I think, that, but it, there are also a couple other things. One is um, the, the it, it was sort of a, I think I was conflating respect for other people with being on top of everything. So particularly with regard to answering all my emails, um, I, I thought if I don't attend to things, I will be de being disrespectful of other people. I will not be, I mean, if you get down to the core of it, I will not, good people do not ignore things that need to be done, <laughs> especially when they affect other people. So there's that whole element to it as well. And um, I'd say that was a much harder one for me to to loosen. And I still struggle with it sometimes um, because, because um, my impact on other people, I'm talking about my identity now. So you all as listeners can think about what yours is. Um, but I have pretty strong identity around being a person who other people can count on and who would never intentionally do anything to hurt somebody else. And you might wonder what does email have to do with hurting somebody else? It's a pretty big stretch, but not in my mind sometimes. Um, so I can see that. I think it's also interesting where email is a medium where you want to be seen as reliable, right? We have this innate desire, but anybody can just email you and usurp your time without your permission. And then you, or I'm mapping this to you, but like I feel guilty if I don't respond to people. And I'm like, but I never asked for this email. I never wanted this email. Like, why am I the one who's on the receiving end of this sort of like guilt? And I'm putting it on myself, obviously, and, and not yeah. other people. Um, is that what happens with you too? Or um, It never actually occurred to me, Shane, to wonder, to think, wow, I didn't ask for this. Um, why do I feel like I have to uh, respond? I just think what 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 we're both describing here is how incredibly complex we are as human beings, right? Yeah. And why it could be so hard to change because we have these back to identity, this sense of ourselves as a certain kind of person, and it has worked. Otherwise we wouldn't have, we wouldn't be here at, at this place where we yeah. have this identity in the first place. Just a random question. Cause I don't want to get it in, but what, what are the best leadership books that you've uh, ever read and taken lessons from? So the first book that ever really, that I can remember ever really shifted my perspective um, uh, was, um, I think it's, Hi Hi it's Heifetz and Linsky, I think, um, Leadership Without Easy Answers. Um, I'm sorry if I've got that co-author wrong because he's a co-author of one of Heifetz's books. Um, and 
it just, it really sh- was the first time I, I got the sense of complexity, actually. It really mm-hmm. disrupted my sense that, um, that things are clear. And um, so that was a, that was a, that's an old one. That's probably 20 years old at this point. Um, another one that really um, uh, impacted, I, I would say, the, the, the way we, the way I've put um, complexity into practice, into leadership practice of our firm was, um, oh, you're testing my memory here. <laughs> Shoot, it's um, Lalu. Um, yeah, I can't remember the name of it. I'm sorry. It's so it's so popular, and it's the idea that organizations also have um, like uh, uh, operating in complexity. Um, organizations like show up differently. And so it had a lot of lessons in it for us as an organization about how we wanted to be um, and how we wanted to create the conditions for ourselves to be um, to be embracing the complexity of the world, embracing it in the way we run ourselves. Um, so that was another one. And uh, if you want to know more about adult development, um, Jennifer Gart, my colleague and friend Jennifer Garvey Berger's book, Changing on the Job was far and away, in my opinion, the best book that's been written about, about about adult development. Not so much the theoretical part, although she it's really good on that, but essentially like what does it mean? What does it mean in terms of creating conditions for humans to be fully human? Um, mm. So that was, um, and it's super accessible. I would highly recommend it. So those are kind of like in three different areas of my life. And then um, there are a couple of really good ones. Um, there's a, um, I don't know why the names of the books are escaping me today, Shane. I'm sorry, I've got the authors. Um, there's a book by a guy named uh, Guy Claxton about, uh, about emotions. It's not, um, uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett wrote How Emotions Are Made, and that's really good too. Mm-hmm. This one goes more deeply into um, like the physiological components of, um, of not only our emotions, but the relationship between our bodies and everything else. Um, and it's really, I would highly recommend it. It's, it, it, it takes some getting through, but it's, it's quite good. If you're curious about the relationship between um, our bodies and, um, and everything else. And last question, uh, what does success mean to you? It sounds so trite. I just want to look back on my life and know that, um, that my presence mattered to somebody else. Like that by me being in, whether it's in a room, you know, running a workshop or whether it's in a friendship, whether it's with my children or my partner or anyone else that my presence mattered. And not because I had great ideas, um, not because I was so smart, but that in my presence, um, another person could be more fully themselves. That's, that's one definition of success for me.